Good afternoon. My name is Daniel Colvin, and I am here uh, representing the Ohio Art League as their program director with uh, one of our uh, members, Ron Anderson. Uh, we are here with uh, the Art Tells a Story, Let It Tell Yours, uh, second installment where we are featuring three different Ohio Art League members. And um, we have with us again, like I said, Ron Anderson. Uh, he's an artist and educator. He's been uh, very prolific and very prestigious in the Columbus community. And Ron, thanks for giving us some of your time this afternoon. Oh, anytime. I mean, you know me. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Stick a camera in front of me and I'll give you Let as go. much as you need. Let it go. All right, folks. Well, Ron and I have actually been uh, kind of hanging out and just you know, talking and warming up for about a half hour, 45 minutes or so. So um, we're just, we've both decided that we're just going to kind of keep this really laid back and uh, uh, free flowing. And um, I'm just going to let Ron do his thing and we're going to talk about whatever he wants to talk about. We're going to have fun with it. So hopefully you guys in, enjoy the conversation. Um, all right, Ron, where do you, with the, man, we talked about a lot over the last hour. <laughs> where, where, where do you want to pick back up? What do you want to dive into? Well, um, choose anything and, we can talk about how the uh, what I do kind of relates to movie making. Yeah, that'll um, work. Because a lot of my images are 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 like movies, um, in that uh, one of my most um, one of my heroes is De Gaulle, and the camera was important to him in creating his work. If you look at his work, it looked like a movie scene. You know, things coming in and out of the uh, picture plane. And um, I've always been one to create images that were more essays than they were multiple choices. So you, the person viewing them would always ask the question, what does this really mean? Well, what does it mean to you? Because I left, I always leave it open-ended. Um, so the question is, what do you want to interpret it as? Uh, the title sometimes, you know, kind of give you some sense. And then sometimes I just kind of play with the idea of throwing something at you that may not make, make absolutely no sense at all. But you look at it and you think, okay, how does this relate to the painting? Uh, sometimes it's just one of those things where I want you to stay with it. So changing titles and the painting are all kind of almost like two different things. It's kind of like writing a story. Um, the great uh, illustrator, uh, N.C. Wyatt, would always develop a story, not around the work, the copy, because he was given the manuscript and he had to create the paintings around that, that, uh, that story, like the uh, Treasure Island or, or the uh, Robin Hood, all those, those uh, stories. But the story that he, the parts that he painted weren't the writing. There was always a stuff in between. And so a lot of my work is the stuff in between. It's kind of like I allow my brain to just kind of go on autopilot and I'm not in as total control of what I put down. And one of the, some of the people that follow me on Instagram, cause I go live almost every day, um, always ask me that question, what does this really mean? Well, I don't know, <laughs> because I didn't start with a concept. I always started with, let's just start here and then let's see where it goes. It's kind of like, it's like water. It just moves where it wants to go. And I just follow where it That's goes. It's kind of interesting because you were, because uh, earlier when we were talking about uh, parallels between um, just the, the, the process of art making in general and influences and, and and a colleagues feeding off of colleagues and, and all these other kind of things. You know, we were talking about the parallels between, um, you know, music and, and art making, you know, specifically jazz. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you said that you like to, you know, listen to a lot of, you know, different jazz and then kind of allow, you know, the, 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 the influence of the music to kind of move you, you know, right. as you're working on a piece. 
I mean, mm-hmm. do you feel sometimes, well, I mean, obviously, you know, the, since you've already said that the, the music influences the piece as you're making it, you know, um, how, how, how strongly do you feel like that, that the uh, direct improvisational of, you know, from a song to a song, or if you, you know, switched from Coltrane to Miles in the middle of a painting, mm-hmm. I mean, like, how, how much do you think that that would include? Because you, you say you throw in these little sparks of, 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 of intrigue and interest and, you know, improvisational elements in the painting that, that, that kind, of, kind of match up, but not quite. But, I mean, like, how, mu- how much of that do you think is, is, is influenced by allowing yourself to be immersed in the improvisation of the music and have it complement your art? Or how much of that is more just... Just, just kind of uh, planning it yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, the um, there's a point where you aren't even listening to the music; it becomes white noise. Right. So I, I don't, I don't listen to anything I'm going to dance to. I would dance to. I listen to music that, and most of the time it's um, progressive jazz. Sometimes, you know, like a a Coltrane. Where and and even if it's something that you can't dance to, you really it's in your head, but it's in your head in a way that <clears throat> allows for, you know. And I'm, I don't want to get too technical because I don't understand a lot of, but your brain just goes places. You allow <clears throat> yourself to just live in that that space, that flow, and so I I couldn't tell you what I listen to because I kind of have it on a playlist and it just goes from one. It's, it's jazz or it's sometimes I'll put it on, you know, Pand- Pandora and I'll play opera. So people are like, you, you listen to opera? Yeah, I listen to opera. I may not understand it, but I listen to it because there's some things in there that help with the narr- narration in my head. <clears throat> and I could t- couldn't tell you why, um, but somehow the work flows around whatever that is that I'm listening to. I've listened to, um, you know, James Brown or some of those guys as well when I'm painting things that relate to um, some of the uh, rhythm and blues artists. Uh, So I even have a couple paintings out in the hallway that are like that. Or if I am interested in rock, I've even put on heavy metal. And I did a piece that was in the Rife Gallery a few years ago. It was called The um, Fanatics. And it were women storming the stage and these rockers that hair on fire and flowing and they were just, you know, ripping those guitars. And I listened to a few heavy metal bands, like, you know, and that got me into the mood of what are those rockers feeling. And so the painting, the paintings happen from that little space inside of my head that says, this is about talking about the stuff in between the words or in between the music. Uh, the same way, you know, N.C. Wyatt probably would have looked at his illustrations. And I'm pretty sure even Rockwell did the same. Some of those artists back in those days, um, you know, as illustrators, because that's when the illustration for magazines and books uh, was important. Uh, and the unfortunate part about it is that when they painted those back in the day, you know, NCY, not NCY, but Norman Rockwell probably looked a bit better because he came at a time when they could take those paintings he did and then you know, print them in magazines or books, the Saturday uh, Evening Post. But NCY was before him. And so that was when they weren't able to do color. They did black and white but he painted them in color because he knew at some that he had to get something out of it himself. So he painted them in full color and they were printed back in the day when they were sent to the uh, publisher in black and white. So if you look at his earlier results of his paintings, they were all black and white. Um, and the interesting thing about it is that black and white is a great uh, place to start with doing work instead of doing something full full color, if I take a photograph and use it, I usually translate it into black and white first because it's important to get the values right and set the mood rather than going, because color is artificial, first of all. 
especially you're going to, unless you're using, you know, working from light, and then you could actually, um, you know, do something with the color because it's right there in front of you. You know, a photograph is basically artificial you know, material. And so you aren't getting true color, you're getting artificial color. So whatever you do with that color is, you know, you either copy, you want to copy it from a, for a color photograph, or you can translate it, something from black and white into your own color. So the color becomes yours instead of an artificial interpretation of that. And so I always liked a lot of the um, art, um, the film noir, because it was, because I thought they were a lot more creative than some of the movies you see today where too much is given away um, because, or they, um, you know, puts too much special effects into it. And so you lose the piece in the special effects and you're thinking, God, what was, it? there's no story here. It's basically like a painter who just is technically sound, you know, does these beautiful paintings that are technically sound with all the detail. Like you see a lot of the larger, these paintings of large heads that are just so almost overly photographic over too real um and they concentrate on just that and you realize okay that's beautifully done technically but where's the part that says i want to stay with this and figure out what this is about and there is um, something to be said about having a more subdued palette you know because i mean there, there's a right. lot of there's a there's a lot of you know painters out there regardless of whether they're abstract or representational or somewhere in between, where you know they're they're using these you know very subdued, almost monocratic kind of dark, you know uh, palettes that mm -hmm. um, that that really forces you to engage and kind of suck you in because they aren't, you know, I mean it's not something that you can catch all the detail from across the room and it's not something. Right that's necessarily going to be like vivid and bright and right in your face. I mean, this, there's a, whatever story or whatever emotions trying to be conveyed there, you're going to have to get up and intimate. I mean, even if it's a large piece, you know, you're going to have to get, you have to get up in it and, and to, to be able to really appreciate all the nuances of it. Well, and color, your color can be, an, color can be a very, uh, can be very distracting. Right. If it's not used properly, um, you have, if you use color, at least for me, it has to be a, used for a purpose. You know, just it put it in there. It also be a crush, too. You know, it sets the mood. Um, yeah. The armature underneath is the black, is the big graphic part. If you were to actually take a photograph in black and white of your of a full painting. You know, color painting, you'll see how incredibly powerful the piece is or not by what the black or the large armature underneath that the color sits on top of. And so the artist has to, to understand how much color do you need and where do you place it and what is this going to do? Color can set the mood um, for a piece. Black and white basically is kind of like a wide do animals see in black and white because they can they because they can see stuff color kind of gets in the way so if i want to see something moving in the bushes my eyes have to focus on black or the black and white image because the black and white images are values and so that one little thing moving in the bushes i can see in black and white i can't see it in color because the rest of the colors distract that's at least how i see it and so um I did, I've been doing a lot of, uh, and I think I started off with black and white because I was a fashion illustrator for a number of years for Halley's. I started at Halley's in Cleveland in Euclid um, many years ago. Um, that was my first job. Um, and that's when fashion illustration was a, uh, was a job. Now it's a means to an end, fashion designers use it um, to design a collection of clothes. Back in the day when I was doing fashion illustrations back in the, in the, um, 
late 70s, mid late 70s. Um, the retail stores they would hire fashion illustrators to illustrate the clothes for retail, and you know they would be in in the magazines and newspapers. And the one um, I think I just lost my train of thought why I was going there in the first place. <laughs> but, um, but you know, illustration um, was storytelling for me. And um, I did fashion illustration different than um, a lot of fashion illustration is done. I, but I did follow some artists that I thought were just incredible artists not necessarily just fashion illustrators. They just were could draw the figure, you know, in just interesting ways, classical, loose, abstract, you know, um, pop. And so all of them had different styles. And the ones that I really gravitated gravitated to were the ones that that felt classical, like a, a Stavarino or or a uh, and then Jim Howard was a lot looser, but he had this sort of classic look and was, you'd have to look him up in order to understand his incredible way that he would interpret the figure. Um, why did I go there? <laughs> I'm not even sure uh, why I ended up on that topic. Uh, well, I think you were trying to tie it back to the to, to the work that you were doing. Um, with, because I mean, I, I'm assuming you were trying to tie it back in some fashion to you know, because I mean, a lot of your paintings are so figurative. I mean, we were well, we were talking about how color and and, and palettes and everything can really affect how. You oh see yeah, mood. We're talking about mood. Not distracting. So. Uh, yeah, because I think color sets the mood. Um, when you have two figures in a piece, it creates a narrative. You know, when you have just one figure, unless you can do something with that figure, body language is important to telling the story. You just have a figure standing there, you know, looking straight out. That could say something. It could say they're startled or they're in deep thought, you know, depending on the gaze. Um, body language is, has been always very important in my painting because body language tells the story uh, without words. And I think um, what I liked about some of the old earlier fashion, or not fashion illustrators, but illustrators, and even fashion illustrators, because it was the ones that were storytelling were more interesting to me than just the ones that just did fashion just for the sake of showing some clothes on a stick figure, basically. Um, I always put a story behind it. So if I, if I got something from upstairs in the um, buyer, would bring something down to be illustrated for a certain day in the, of the month or the week. Um, I had to take, and it, some of the clothes weren't that interesting, you know, but they were excited about it. So I had to be excited about it. So I had to find something in that piece that I could tell a story around. Uh, they brought something down and just to give you a sense of the narrative behind taking something simple and then making people see themselves in that outfit. They brought down something that looked like, um, if you were to look at it closely, it felt like um, uh, the Chrysler building in New York. Um, it was um, Art Deco. And so I put it on the tallest building in Columbus, that, which at that time was a um, um, made-up building because <laughs> it did. It was the tallest building ever in any place because everything looked like it was like miles below. You know? uh, but I wanted to feel like um, King Kong, and this was Fay Ray on top of this building with a. Um, and you, if you go on Instagram, you'll see that that one drawing. But I did that for Madison's. And she had on this dress that was looked like the, uh, the Chrysler building. And so I wanted her to feel like Faye Ray on top of that, of a large or a tall building looking out into the dark. And so 
even though that was a cheap dress, you know, if you looked at it up close, it was a very fairly cheap dress, but it looked spectacular when you put it on. And so my job was to bring people down, or the, the women downtown to, to buy it. And so I had to tell the story, like we're telling the story here. Um, all of my work is about telling the story, the narrative, right? I've tried to do um, abstract, but I find myself sometimes putting something in there representational because I, and most of the time it'll be a figure. It'll be a human figure somehow in there because I think human figures, um, when you put a human figure in, no matter where you put them in, even if you put them next to a still life, it becomes a story. It becomes a narrative of some sort. And so um, all my work eventually as a fashion illustrator become, came about storytelling. So if you saw the Columbus Monthly and we're in there for a few, almost monthly, um, and those pieces were about storytelling. Uh, in fact, I used to put my wife, um, when I was dating her, I would, um, she had a, has a mole uh, just below her lip here. And that was my way of courting her. <laughs> I'd say, look in the next month's Columbus Monthly and see if you could find a mole. And there was one time there was a mole, the one fashion figure was holding the hand of a child and she couldn't find it, but the child was holding the balloon and I put it on the balloon. <laughs> and, she, and, I, and she says, well, I can't find it this time. Where is it? And I said, look a little closer and then tell me. And she found it was on, on the balloon or um, I put it on the little, there was a little girl too in another thing. So my, it's always about storytelling. A lot of my stuff, I don't have a clue what they're about when I do them because uh, I don't edit much of it. Um, and I've had that conversation with um, some ladies in Turkey who kind of tune into my Instagram um, live videos, and they are always kind of, you know, in wonder of what I will create out of something. They'll just see me make some marks, and then all of a sudden it, it translates and transforms into something. And they are, you know, it's almost like magic to them that, you know, I can just start with something and then end up with this thing that really starts to tell a story. And I, I think we were talking earlier, um, I would just do a painting or a drawing and I would just post it without any, I would have put a title to it, but I wouldn't put any copy. Um, and somewhere along the way, you know, cause I was trying to see how many people I can pull onto the site. And I heard that, you know, you have to, and that may be true or not, that people tend to, um, look at your, your page when there's some copy attached to it. And so I started doing that. And it started with something that I'm not even sure, and you have to go to my website on Instagram to see it. Um, and you'll follow it and you'll see where it started and where it is now. And in fact, you know, Daniel, I'll probably send you a copy of the, the writing. But I started writing the first one and it just built on that on that one image. And there were, I think it may be 40 some, and this is during this pandemic that was kind of stuck at home. I wasn't here because it's like we were talking earlier. This is my first time in here since earlier this you year. probably mention real quick that uh, Ron is in his uh, studio at Millworks. Um, so uh, Millworks is a facility um, out on the east side, close to the uh, airport area. Um, uh, 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 I had a studio out there for a couple years um, in, before I, you know, bought my house, mm -hmm. built it out for my studio. And um, Ron is still there. He was just down the hall. We used to hang out and talk in the hallway all the time. So, um, but yeah, so you are coming to us live from your millwork studio. I forgot to mention that earlier, but. Oh, yeah. I, I thought it was important, more important to come in here than to do it at home because my space at home yeah. Um, doesn't look like my studio. It's, you yeah. know, I'm living with some, with my wife. So, you know, 
<laughs> you know, she doesn't want to look like a warehouse. So I, you know, and it started to look like that. So well, I thought you're living hey, with your wife or you've got other problems. Huh? <laughs> I said, hopefully you're living with your wife at home. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you know, she, there was always the complaint is you know, and she's got she's as soon as I the first big uh, commission came. Right. With um, who was it with? Oh, no, it was a New York exhibit. And, you know, she was kind of like in the middle, of, you know, like a lot of wives are when or when their husband is an artist, they're just like their parents, they think, OK, yeah, I'm going to be an artist. Why don't you just do that as a hobby? I mean, she wasn't like that, but she she was waiting for the something to happen with it. And, you know, mm -hmm. went to New York and sold almost all the, the work there. Oh, the moles. And it was a big check. Huh? I said the, the moles didn't convince her. Uh, are you saying the mole? No, the the, 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 the moles. You, the, the moles in the magazine. I was just, I was doing a call. Oh, well, well no, she liked those. Like the moles didn't convince her. <laughs> Bruh, those because I was. That was my day job. I was. Yeah. I've always been an artist, um, even commercially, or even um, professionally. I was yeah. a commercial artist. And right. so that was my day job as commercial artist. That's what I was doing for Madison's and Lazarus, sure. Alice Higgies and Maycomb's is that I was doing fashion illustration. So that was a paycheck. Right, so right. that was cool. Right. <laughs> yeah. it's when, you, when you decide, okay, oh, well, maybe I should abandon the and just go straight into the fine arts and right. let's see what happens <laughs> while we starve to death. Um, <laughs> so... I still kept that. I was never brave enough to just kind of jump out there and say, oh, I'm just going to abandon the commercial world and I'm just going to go full time. Now, I'm, you know, retired now, you know, I'm living the dream that I, you know, would have lived back then if I had chosen a different direction. But, you know, I've, you know, I've watched other artists who have gone and just kind of completely abandoned the, that, safety net and gone out there and and uh you know and it's there's nothing wrong with making a few mistakes as you go out there and you decide on on what works and what doesn't and you can always come back you know but i wasn't you know i wasn't going to go ahead and give up because i was still doing art you know if i had been doing something like um that i was bored with then i would have given it up and gone ahead and tried to do the fine arts or you know, the the uh, painter thing but i was doing art uh, i was doing you know illustrations for the madison stores for years uh, i think i ended up doing a you know close to a thousand drawings um, for them because it was daily and i wasn't just doing it for columbus i was doing it for uh uh, Cincinnati, Wisconsin, um, in uh, Indianapolis. Uh, so I was still doing art, and I was always wondering where, whether there were other artists doing what I was doing. And some of my friends were graphic designers, and they said, "Well, we wish we could we could do illustration because that's basically, you know, um, you know, to a great extent, fine arts to me." Um, some people, some artists would say, "Well, that's kind of not." Um, what we would consider, um, because if you're not doing what back in the day, not doing abstract expressionism or anything that's abstract, um, it wasn't high art, it was the low art, because they relate, you know, painting representational figures and things with artists that got jobs you know, painting things for the church because it was basically purely um, propaganda for the church. You had all the people that were basically um, were um, uh, weren't able to read. So the way the church controlled them was through, you know, painting biblical scenes. I can control you if I can create the narrative for you. Since you can't read it, I can tell you how you should think. And and so I think that stigma came from representational work when it relates to people that were illiterate, that couldn't read. This is their way of telling, you know, controlling that narrative. And if you look at 
um, there's still propaganda paintings today. You know, you look over in other countries where you know you've got um, someone like you know in North Korea or Russia. You know, they're painting things that only the leaders want you to paint. Uh, so my, and I think anytime you do representation work, it does become to some extent your propaganda because you're telling the story, a narrative story. You're saying, this is how I want you to think about this. And in most cases, I try to stay away from telling or, or giving you one way to look at something. I leave it kind of open-ended, like we were talking earlier about, um, I think of my work as an essay as opposed to, to uh, multiple choice where you pick a, you know, a right answer. There's no right answer to mine. In fact, um, I find pieces that are a lot more complicated because there isn't a straight answer to them. It's kind of like telling them the ending to a story or a movie when you think, okay, the person that you shared this excitement with is never gonna go and see it. So you say, oh, okay, you're not gonna ever go and see it. So here's the ending. Here's what the story is about. And here's the ending. And now that person is saying, well, that was kind of good. And I wish you hadn't explored it because I may have wanted to go and see it. And that's kind of what the painting or piece of artwork does is it, it gives you some clues, but they're not a straight arrow to that answer that you, know, you nice have to about, that, but that is the nice thing about some of your um more narrative work because you I mean you tend to have you, you tend to have these paintings full of um characters you know and then some some, some of them seem to be you know uh, uh, some of them i mean it's it, it it depends on the painting i mean because because uh, there are a lot of your paintings that i've looked at where where it's like it feels like um it's partitioned like, like, you know, I mean, and it feels like in a real life in, in such a way, like, you know, where you would walk into um, like a real life setting in a room full of strangers where you can obviously tell that all of these people are in the same space, but they are definitively divided up into like, okay, well, these three are interacting together, but they have right. no idea, nor do they care what these two over here are doing. You know, right. it's like, but, but, but then there's also this sense of like, they all relate in some way for something that either just happened or something that's about to happen, you know? <laughs> um, and and every, every once in a while, there's a sense of something happening right now, you know, mm -hmm. but, but, but there's always that, you know, that the that that uh that flex in, in, in narrative you know and um and i think that you know anybody who chooses to to deal with um you know the 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 use of people in their work like that i mean it just creates um just this deeper sense of intrigue that you can't help but just sit, sit there and immerse yourself in it for a minute i mean like mm -hmm. if, if you enjoy that you know i mean you know not to mention your overall just you know your, your your style you have a very expressive very aggressive just kind of uh you know expressive you know style of of so basically you're you're creating drama with the characters and your techniques yeah and, you I, and I choose the i choose um uh color like i said as a way to as an emotional expressive way of saying let me give you an example there's a painting right here that i i think i can turn well, let me get my hand out of the way here <laughs> can i flip this around is that possible are you on your phone yeah uh, uh, uh yeah you, there, there should be a little well, let me do this or, or you can just move it case yeah we can see it Okay. Uh, I've got my fingers in the way. Um, it's this piece here. Can you see this painting? Yeah. Um, ballerinas. Right. Uh, in fact, better still, let me do this. There's one behind, I can just pick it up. This one is on this, and so I can get a better sense of what I'm touching here. Mm. 
Oh, touched the wrong thing, Ron. <laughs> there you go. Um, now, this one is called uh, the Cocktail Hour. And that guy right there is a gangster. And the story is more about what you can't see. He's obviously startled by someone who has just walked in. Um, and the way that the gaze is looking directly at the viewer, it's almost mm -hmm. as if you're the person, either either you are the person that just walked in that he wasn't expecting, or you are like directly next to the guy that just walked in that, right. you know, I mean, or, 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 or you know, like that, that would be the sort of thing to where, like, I have no idea why you're looking at me like that. So you would look <laughs> over your shoulder to see who just walked in, you know? Mm -hmm. And I mean, you can obviously tell these two guys are together. They're probably part of the, you know, obviously he looks like he's in charge. He's the one, the boss. Right. Um, there's a guy, I'm not sure if you can see it, but there's a guy in the front. You can see him right there. Yeah. Low. Uh, obviously, is there must be a, some sort of conversation going on because he's been he's a, turning his head to where this person is talking, which is like this guy here, and right, obviously right. she knows who this person is too. Um, so that's the storytelling that. And as I'm doing the piece, I'm kind of telling the story. And then the title, The Cocktail Hour. When you think about the cocktail hour is kind of like one of those things where you don't hear that used as much today because you don't think of cocktail hours, you know, people going to a uh, bar. Right. Um, and having some drinks. Right. So I wanted, I dated it with the title by saying cocktail instead of just bar um, or drinks. And so um, the whole idea was to to put you someplace at that time period. I've, I've got to be careful what I show <laughs> because you know my work. <laughs> it can be pretty uh, um, racy. Um, I'm not sure if you saw the new or the, um, and I do kind of these sort of satires too on on uh, social um, um, comments. And so you probably, if you go to Instagram, you probably see the. In fact, I sent this to you, David. <laughs> That's funny. About the <laughs> the fly. They got so much more press than the debate did. So I, this morning I got up and, and did this fly and I sent it out and posted it. So that's, um, I think I was just a born storyteller. Um, let's see what I else. Saw, I saw quite a few memes this morning about that whole fly thing. It was interesting. You know, oh, yeah. the funny thing about it is I, I, I missed that whole thing because I was in the kitchen doing stuff but my like i had it on listening to it while, while i was like doing chores basically in the kitchen and so chores I, <laughs> so I had, what are those so, so i had no idea what anybody was talking about until the next day and i'm like oh i completely missed that so well it's funny because he just kind of um came in and landed and he stayed there for a couple minutes yeah that's what and that's most of the time you know you know and his hair must be like uh, painted on. <laughs> most people can feel like something moved around in there. Right, right, yeah. right. Well, I know if a fly gets, you know, I don't care where they are, they land in your hair. You don't feel it if you're sensitive to the. Well, at least there wasn't so much product in there that it got stuck. That would have been interesting. Oh, yeah. Well, he probably stayed there because there was too much product in there, you know, and they probably love the smell of it. Whatever it was, but anyway, that's the sort of stuff I and I I've been playing with um, this. I think I was telling you about the storytelling 
and writing and posting the writing along with the uh, image right. on, in, on Instagram. And so I did 40 some uh, pieces on this and um, I can send those to you. There's actually, and I was thinking about it, but I think it was probably impossible to do it, put it on here because it was too large to send. Sure. Uh, but I did a movie, it's like 40 some uh, images for the story. And every one of them I wrote something about. Um, and the story is, is related to the pandemic. It starts off with a woman who you know, has a boyfriend, his name is John. You never know her name. You know, I didn't, I didn't write her name. And then some of the people who have been following her said, well, what's the girl, the woman's name? And I said, I don't want to tell you that. I'll let you, you maybe that, that woman is you. So I don't put a name on it because that could be you. So you, if you want to make that you, then you put your name on it. But the guy that she was with that was sharing the apartment with her, her boyfriend, his name was John. And you could tell because of isolation, there was just the two of them there. And, you know, John was having some trouble. She was having more trouble in the, in the space by, because that's all they did. They were isolated together, but John every once in a while would get upset and he would leave. So the writing was about this, this almost crazy world now that we're living in where um, it doesn't seem, it seems very surreal. You're looking outside and you, there's no, no, no persons on the street below. They're in this, uh, it, which looks like New York or some metropolitan city in somewhere in the world. And so you, he would go down and buy a bagel and a cup of coffee and he'd bring, that would be breakfast every day because you know, he would leave early and she would wake up and he was not there and she knew where, that he had gone down and picked up something. You know, and she was kind of slowly seeing things in the apartment because she was going through this whole thing about cabin. She was going through cabin fever and it affected her mentally and she was starting to see things. In fact, you know, John came home and she was in the shower um, struggling with the noises that she was hearing. And so she was in the, in the shower just staring or sta standing there. And he came in and she was there and he had to help her out of there. So she was slowly losing her mind. And then all of a sudden, several things happened in the piece. So I'll send you the story. You can tell me what you think. And it, it came, it went from a romantic novel or a piece to murder, science fiction, because they ended up on a, <laughs> somewhere. And I haven't finished the story. It's still going. It's kind of like, you know, the episodes of The Walking Dead. Right. Uh, but they end up on the spaceship and being going through these experimentations. And they still haven't left the spaceship, so they're still there. That's where I left the story. Um, but um, it's an interesting piece because I've never done a, I've done visual writing, but not so much with words. It was all about visual. So I tell the story with visuals. That's why this is interesting. That's why I wanted to do this, you know. Uh, this interview because I love the title that you apply to this. And so it's telling the story. Um, and because I was pretty much stuck to a, for a while there, like all of us were, where we were um, not necessarily forced, but some of us took it serious that, you know, we need to isolate ourselves from crowds of people. You know, luckily I wasn't working so it was easy because as an artist, you know, isolation is what you do. You know, if you're doing anything serious, you're stuck, you're in the studio creating work. If you're not in the studio creating work, then what are you doing as an artist? You know, your body of work happens when you're in here by yourself. That's why it was very difficult. It's very difficult for me to have a um, um, share a space with another artist because they, if you looked at my space, you've been here, Daniel, so you know how crazy my space looks. And I leave stuff as a... You, your space is just as occupied as mine. It's very busy. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I, I you know, my studio, not quite as bad as uh, Francis Bacon, 
but it's it's close. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. and you know how he, he loves his space to look um, trashed. You know, he just drops stuff right. on the floor, leave it. But um, so a lot of my work is more improv than it is where I plan it out. And all of a sudden, the storytelling, where I was writing, doing the illustration or the drawing or the painting, and then writing at the end of the the pro, the, uh, the end of the, the uh, painting or the, the uh, or the drawing, and I post it, and I write a story behind it that were all related to the same story, so it always connected the, all of the drawings and paintings to this couple. Um, and that was probably the first time that I'd done any real writing around any of the images that I posted. Um, and now we were talking earlier, you know, I was um, one of Fioris' students a few years ago when I was trying to get, you know, continue my certification for, um, for you know, the Fort Hayes, uh, uh, fashion and and uh, interior design program that I was uh, teaching, and so you had to take a class every two or three classes every five years to continue it. And so I was taking this class up at OSU that was about um, the first class, the one class, which was a woman that he said was from Germany, and she taught drawing. But this drawing class was an advanced drawing class. It was about telling stories. It was, a, and she only gave me one concept, which I thought was was fantastic. Once I realized what, what I could do with that, she kind of left it open ended, which I think is beautiful for uh, instructor to say, "Okay, here's the concept. Everyone's going to use this concept, but whatever you do with it is up to you." And the concept. Um, was to tell a story, whether it be representational, abstract, or whatever you want to do. But the story had to be built around a trip from Columbus, Ohio to Paris, France. And you had to figure out how what that story was going to look like. Um, and I chose something called some like French Connection, where it was drug related. And um, there was a murder in the very beginning, and they had uh, the woman survived it. Her boyfriend didn't because he was part of this uh, tragic, or well, this. Well, he actually um, uh, shortchanged the gangsters, and he ended up getting killed. And, all of this was happening over in France and it was a drug connection. And so I did it all in a visual and um, ended up, I think, in maybe a week or two, 30 some drawings um, that came out of that, that told that story visually. And every time I thought, okay, this doesn't, there needs to be a link here. And I would always add that, that middle part. It's not like doing a, a storyboard. You know, you try to find a, smooth transition from the first frame to the end of the frame or the movie. And so that's how I kind of went about it. Here's what it's going to begin with. And here is how it's going to end. And I, all the other stuff kind of built. It was very easy to, to do once you did that. If you put a middle, the beginning, a middle, and an end, and then fill in the other parts of it. Um, and then things can actually change. And that's kind of what I did. I, went back to that because I'm thinking, okay, I should do something where I'm telling a story because I, to a great extent, I love storytelling visually. Um, but this time I added words to it instead of just a visual story. And because visual storytelling is, is what I've always kind of done that started with fashion illustration. I think even as a kid, that was, you know, these interesting sort of uh, stories. You mean this new... You, you mean this newest one that you are? Yes, the newest you're, one. Like you're, you're, you're drawing a parallel from this past influence of this right. old project that you had with Fioris. It's so that, that kind of inspired you, you know, right. during the you know pandemic seclusion to 
kind of right. revisit. What can I do with what I kind of started years ago? And I thought what I thought, and the reason why I bring that up is because I thought, you know, Fiora's kind of taught me how to just kind of slow things down and and build a body of work around some writing or at least thinking about how do I, how can I create a body of work and not think, okay, um, where a lot of artists will be, um, um, will not have an idea of what they want to do. Um, I was able to do that with writing about it. Um, Cause sometimes you get stuck. Writing helps you, helps to unstick you. Because what it says, I don't have to create lots of different things. I can stay with one narrative and I can move through that narrative with, if I can think of them in terms of frames, you know, how do I get, how do I create a body of work that is um, consistent, um, that has a, uh, uh, what do you call it, a sequence to the development. When you see um, exhibits of artists' work, mm -hmm. a body of work that they've done, it usually there's it's consistent. So it's sequenced and it's consistent. Um, and it's about, and it's a scope. So how do you move from this to that? And how can you create a body of work? Sometimes writing it down and then creating around that, you know, even if it's an abstraction, you know, how do I develop an ab a body of work that's abstract, that has consistent connection? Right. Um, and the way you do that is you do some writing. Writing helps with um, keeping you focused because if you know my work, I can jump all over the place. You know, just like I'm doing right now. I'm kind of like that guy with the remote control that you're saying, hey, cut. you know, he's flipping channels every five seconds. I'm that, you know, remote uh, clicker guy who's right. just constantly changing channels because I'm seeing one image pops in and then I, and then another image pops in and I'm all I'm all over the place. And by the time I look up, I've got so many different ideas that can go different directions. And that yeah. is tougher for me to lock things down because I have so many ideas that it's hard for me to stay in one place. So that's actually yeah. a good segue because we're we're uh, we're rolling up on an hour. So okay. so we need to you know I can talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right, right. So we need to so I mean like uh uh if we, if, if we could uh, go ahead and just switch switch channels to uh to to a final okay roll out is there um is there anything uh it was is there any other uh, uh thoughts or or uh or anything anything in particular you want to leave us with uh because i mean it's a it's been a been a really interesting conversation uh so i i, I enjoyed it immensely um and, and I, I do look forward to seeing this uh, this 40 never a quiet moment when you're talking to me <laughs> it's it's just straight straight chatter um <laughs> all right well you know there there, there 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 wasn't a whole lot to throw in <laughs> you like you, you, had, you, did, you had some good flow so i didn't want to interrupt i i interjected where necessary uh okay. but uh but yeah, it's like I'm I'm looking forward to seeing this this uh the sporty pack project that you got going on. Are there gonna be more than 40 or is there or is it just uh, well it's it's kind of like you know walking dead, you know, it stops for you know a few yeah. weeks or months, yeah. and then you know, all of a sudden, you know, they say, Well, it's coming back in on September the such and such, yeah. and we will continue the story. This will be the eleventh. Yeah. And you're thinking about these up on Instagram, you said, or, or you have? Yeah, they're on Instagram, but I, I'm going to send you because on Instagram, you unless you really know where to start, right. you're not going to know yet. You know, so right. I'll send you the story because uh, I have it on. It's on. Um, uh, God, what do you call it? Uh, I can't even think what it's called, but it, it'll give yeah, you. It's almost it's set up just about. like a like a book. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll cool. send that to you. You can read it, you know. And like I said, I don't edit. I don't even edit the writing. So you know, the writing can be 
probably <laughs> confusing because I have I don't go back in there and edit. I just let it be um, right. schizo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what it feels like. Oh, um, well, you know, it's like let it let it be free form like everything else. There's nothing wrong with that. Right. So I, I you know, um, I'm enjoying myself. Um, I look at this. I see a lot of people, a lot of artists who are struggling with this pandemic and the isolation of that it, that it puts out there. Um, and I hear you hear a lot of people in the very beginning um, thinking, okay, if I only had the time, I would do this and I would do that. And I'm thinking you have the time now. So this isolation is a way for you to say, you know, I'm not, maybe you lost your job and you always wanted to do this one thing and become an, an entrepreneur and have your own business or whatever you're going to do. Or maybe you just, you've always wanted to be an artist, but you were basically too afraid to step away from that job because that was your security. Now you don't have that security. You've lost it. So what do you do? Try out the thing that you always wanted to do but couldn't find the time to do. But I see it's too many artists that are whining about, okay, I'm really like, I'm having a hard time staying at home. You know, I'm missing my friends. You know, you, know, you have the time now, do something. Um, I always, my students always said, you know, I'm bored. And I said, do you realize being, Bored means that you're boring to people who see you. You're bored because you're boring. You're not doing anything to make yourself interesting. I mean, so don't you think if you're bored, don't you think other people are thinking that too? I said, do something. I said, every single day that you wake up, you should go to bed thinking I did something. I accomplished something in that day. Don't go to bed thinking, okay, that was a wasted day. You know, because you only have so many. And at some point, you have to do what you love. Um, and if this is, if you get any consolation from this pandemic and the isolation, one of the things that I would say is that think of how you can make your life interesting. Take this time to do that. Find your voice while you have the time. Um, and that's what I've done. I don't, you know, this is sad that, and I'd like to say to all the people who have died because of this pandemic, this virus, I think the last time I checked it was like 213,000 and some people that have died in this country from this thing. Um, that's sad. Um, but, you can't do anything about that. You know, you don't have any control over that. That's something, and like I've always told people who are worried about stuff they can't control, you know, worry about the things you can. You can only control the things that you can ta tangibly touch. Things that you do, how you brand yourself to other people. What is you? What are you saying to other people about who you are? So if you aren't doing anything, if, um, with your life, then you're boring to other people. So that's kind of what I would say. With this pandemic, don't just sit around. All those things, think about those things that you thought you could do if you had the time. You had the time. Unless you're going back to work, then, you know, then continue that. That sounds like uh, the perfect parting words of wisdom. <laughs> well, I think of artists. Artist does that in their work. You know, the, yeah. there's always the parting wisdom in their work. There's something to say about every image that you do. There's something to leave behind. You know, I don't like to get too preachy about some of those images because that's why I kind of leave them open ended. Right. Well, it's been a pleasure, sir. I appreciate your time. I, I hope that everybody enjoyed this. Um, I, I know that I've enjoyed hosting this little mini series. We've got one more coming up next week. And um, yeah, thanks for uh, tuning well, thank in. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Jim and Michael, um, for you know allowing this to happen. I think this is perfect. 
um, I've been waiting for somebody to do this. I've always said when I saw, when I would see a uh, student who was interested in cinematography, um, that may be a student and need an assignment or need a project, you've got plenty of artists here in town. All you need to do is stick a camera in front of them because they need to be able to tell their own story. Don't have somebody years later when you've died and tell your story because they're gonna always tell it wrong. <laughs> you know, it's not to what, you, it's what you say is important. Not what someone else says about you. Kind of like branding, what do you put out there is what they, is lasting. Right. So thank you all for allowing me to, to sit here and go on and on. <laughs> and I know I jump all over the place, so that's difficult to pin me down on any particular thing. But this was fun. I enjoyed it. It's, it's, it's the format that we chose. So it's, it worked out well for what we wanted to do. Yeah. All right, well, folks. Thank you. Until next Thanks time. See you next yeah, week. Anything?